Okay, so today's video is going to cover a variety of things. Hopefully, most of them are review. Okay, for anything that is not review or that you don't recognize from middle school, um, like always, make sure you take good notes, um, personalize them for yourself, because remember, they essentially are your book. Okay, so as we move forward, this unit is going to focus a lot on cells in particular. Remember that we have organisms that are both unicellular, so just one cell. Okay, those would be things like bacteria, yeast, you can see the amoeba up here in the picture, and organisms that are multicellular. So they're going to be made of lots of cells. For example, us, um, the frog in the picture, trees, um, flowers, any, any organism with more than, essentially any organism with more than one cell. So when organisms are multicellular, they are, they are divided into different, um, different layers for back of it, lack of a better term. So let's look at that organizational levels. So we have five layers of organization in a multicellular organism. Hopefully, again, you are familiar with these. Remember, we have a cell, then from a cell to a tissue to an organ. So for example, this is a stomach cell. This is an epithelial tissue. So lining the cell, lining the stomach. There's the stomach. There's the digestive system. So moving up to the organ system, which is going to be part of the human. So level one, two, three, four, and five. Remember, they build on one another. So a cell is going to be our smallest functional unit of life. So our smallest functional unit of life, meaning this is the smallest thing that can still be alive. So the parts of a cell, a lysosome, a nucleus, not alive. DNA, not alive. A, um, a, an organism can have just one cell to be alive, but it has to have at least one cell. Remember, tissues are going to be groups of cells working together with similar functions. Organs, groups of tissues working together, system, organ systems, groups of organs working together, organisms, groups of systems working together. Again, if you need a refresher on that, write those down again, right? Tissues, groups of cells with similar function, organs, groups of tissues, systems, groups of organs, organisms, groups of systems. So as we mentioned, cells are the basic unit of life, and they're going to be specialized based on in a multicellular organism, they're going to be specialized based on what it is that their job is. So the example given here is a skin cell. So a little more, a um, little different than let's say a fat cell or a muscle cell, because its job is to um, form a barrier to the outside. So it's going to have keratin protein in it, where a muscle cell will be full of protein fibers that help it move. A, um, so cells are going to be differentiated in a multicellular organism for the job that they do. In a unicellular organism, like this one right here, the cell is going to be doing all of the jobs that the organism needs. So the cell is going to, it's not going to be specialized for one particular job. Okay, so now let's shift to a little bit of cell review. We're going to look at um, different types of cell as well as parts of the cell. Okay, so we have two basic types of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells have no membrane-bound organelles. A lot of times you see that as no nucleus. Okay, but in addition to no nucleus, they have no Golgi apparatus, no mitochondria, no vacuoles, no chloroplast. They have no membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells are bacterial cells. Okay, that's what you see over there in the upper right. So you'll see there is no membrane-bound organelles in this organism here. However, this organism does have genetic material. It does have cytoplasm, so the jelly-like stuff within the cell. It does have a cell membrane. We're going to clean this up a little bit to get in there. 
Okay, so it does have a cell membrane on the edge here, and it does have ribosomes, which are the little dots within it. Okay, so prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells have all of those things. They have some form of genetic material, which is usually DNA, um, although occasionally it could be RNA, but usually DNA. Cytoplasm, the jelly-like stuff that fills the cell. The cell membrane, which creates a barrier. There has to be separation from the inside of the organism to the outside of the, to the outside world. And then ribosomes, which are going to make proteins. Remember, proteins are essential. No proteins, no enzymes, no ability to control your chemical reactions, a no living. A eukaryotic cell is going to have membrane-bound organelles. So a eukaryotic cell with membrane-bound organelles, sometimes you'll see this written as having a nucleus. But in addition to a nucleus, they're going to have endoplasmic reticulum. Um, they're going to have mitochondria. They're going to have chloroplast. Okay? And so our basic types of eukaryotic cells that we'll refer to a lot are going to be plant cells versus animal cells. And as we move through, we'll talk about major differences. A number one thing is plant cells are going to have a cell wall. And if you remember back, remember that cell wall is made of cellulose, os meaning sugar. Remember cellulose is a, a polysaccharide that is going to be found in the cell wall of plants. Animals have no cell wall. There are for sure other differences. Plant cells have a chloroplast, which animal cells do not have a chloroplast. Plant cells also have a central vacuole, and we'll talk about both of those as we move through this video. Animal cell won't have either one of those things. Okay, so key components here is that all cells have those four things. DNA, cytoplasm, cell membrane, and ribosomes. Prokaryotic cells, no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells do have nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. Okay, so let's get a little bit into cell parts here. So we have a ribosome, which technically is not a membrane-bound organelle. So this is found in all types of cells, so in both prokaryote and eukaryotic cells. This is vital because it assembles proteins. No ribosomes, no proteins, a, no enzymes, no um, structural proteins, no movement proteins, none of it. A, so we got to have ribosomes. We'll visit, revisit ribosomes when we get into protein synthesis. In images of cells, um, ribosomes are generally represented by just these little dots. You can see these attached ribosomes, and then there's also free ribosomes, just little dots within the cell. Okay, so now let's look a little bit closer at actual organelles. Organelles are the membrane-bound ones, so technically a ribosome doesn't fit that category. A, um, Organelles allow cells to do specialized functions. They can, um, they can separate the cell, allowing it to do various things like maybe it does packaging. Maybe it focuses on digestion. Okay? So it allows these, the cell to specialize within itself. Okay? Um, so these Specialized, specialized cells can also act as containers, so they can isolate parts of a cell, which is important. You'll see this, um, I think the best example would be uh, with digestion, right? Digestion usually requires an acidic type environment, things that are going to break down the parts of the cell. So we want to keep that isolated. We don't want to break down nice, healthy parts of a cell. Lastly, these organelles provide another set of membranes that um, can do chemical reactions. Um, when we get into photosynthesis and respiration, we'll be talking about elect electron transport chains, which don't really, which can't occur as well without these membranes to help them. So a wide variety of reasons as to why these organelles um, become important 
in a eukaryotic cell. That's why a eukaryotic cell is so much more complex and can do so much more than a prokaryotic bacterial cell. Okay, so we're going to pick a couple of these organs and we're going to look at them individually. So the first one that we're looking at here is a nucleus. So the nucleus is going to house the DNA. So the DNA cannot leave this nucleus. So when we're looking at this image down at the bottom here, there's our nucleus there. The DNA is within it. It is the nucleus is surrounded. The outside membrane of the nucleus is called the nuclear envelope. Okay? And it has nuclear pores, which are little openings, but the DNA doesn't fit through those. RNA will, but DNA does not. And again, when we do protein synthesis, we'll talk about um, why it's important that the RNA is able to fit through there. So main thing here is that our nucleus is going to house our DNA in our eukaryotic cells. Remember, we're focused solely on eukaryotic cells now that have these membrane-bound organelles. So within eukaryotic cells, there are two types of endoplasmic reticulum. We have rough and smooth. Rough endoplasmic reticulum means that it has ribosomes attached to it. That's what makes it rough or bumpy. So in the image down here, you can see that there is smooth endoplasmic reticulum with no ribosomes attached, and then rough endoplasmic reticulum with those ribosomes attached. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum helps act as a transport throughout the cell. So it's a tubing network that can help move things within the cell. And then it will also help finish folding the proteins. Remember, we have mentioned before that the protein shape is critical to its function. And so some proteins have a little bit more complex folding and the rough endoplasmic reticulum can help finish with that folding. That's why the ribosomes are there. Ribosomes help make proteins. And so the ribosomes that are attached to the rough ER will then use the rough ER to help finish folding that protein. Okay, so looking at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic retic reticulum is important in detoxification, so breaking down poisons or toxins. Okay, um, so detox as well as lipid synthesis. Remember, we had those steroid-based hormones that were important for cell communication and regulation, and so the smooth ER will help make those. So breaking down, detoxifying poisons or toxins, and synthesizing lipids. The Golgi apparatus is found um, heavily, uh, you find more of it in organism, cells that are specialized for secretion. So for releasing things out of the cell. So not packaging things that are going to be used somewhere else locally within the cell, but packaging things that are going to be sent out of the cell. So the Golgi apparatus will help package those proteins and lipids that are going to be secreted all the way out of the cell. So you'll notice here's the proteins and lipids coming to the Golgi apparatus in these transport vesicles. So coming to the Golgi apparatus here, and then these secretory vesicles here are headed over to the cell membrane so that those particular proteins or lipids can then be secreted completely out of the cell. So lysosomes are an example that we mentioned a little bit ago about how they do digestive function. So lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. So because they contain digestive enzymes, those digestive enzymes could break down food, they can break down damaged part of the cell. So you don't want them touching healthy parts of the cell. So by having this membrane surrounding it, the lysosome is keeping those enzymes away from the healthy parts of the cell. So in this particular instance, this cell took in a food particle. A, that food particle is contained within a membrane, within a vacuole. The lysosome then releases its digestive enzymes into that vacuole, and now there's nice and digested food. The cell can absorb the nutrients that it needs and then spit out whatever it doesn't need. 
So again, these are only found in eukaryotic cells because so far, all of these examples, the nucleus, both kinds of endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, and lysosome are all membrane-bound organelles. Okay, and let's look at a vacuole. A vacuole is essentially a storage vesicle. Okay, so it will store various materials. Plants have a specialized vacuole called a central vacuole. Um, its main job is to hold water. And this is really important for a plant. We'll talk about this more when we talk about um, cell transport and water moving in and out of a cell. But a plant doesn't have a skeletal system. So the pressure inside of the cells, because a plant does have a cell wall, the pressure inside of the cells is what allows the plant to stand up you know, strong. Uh, so plants have this central vacuole that can be filled with water, which is how you know that the plant doesn't need water. It's not wilty, it's not leaning over because the pressure in that vacuole is good. We and animal cells, so here's an animal cell over here, has have vacuoles. They're just smaller vacuoles. We don't have one centrally located vacuole like the plant cells do because we still need to store things, but we don't need to create that pressure. And we can't create that pressure within our cells because we don't have cell walls. Okay, we've got two final um, organelles we're going to need to look at here. So a mitochondria, and then we'll look at a chloroplast. So mitochondrial's job is to um, essentially create ATP. Um, it's going to create ATP during the process of cellular respiration. And we'll um, obviously look at that in more detail. It'll have its own completely separate video. A, a mitochondria has a little bit different structure. It's actually a double membrane structure. You can see how it has one outer membrane and then it has a second inner membrane. This is a prime example of um, needing those extra membranes to do certain chemical reactions. Okay. Um, one of the key things we need to remember about a mitochondria is that every single eukaryotic cell has one, including a plant. Okay. Remember, a plant, yes, a plant makes its own food, right? But a plant still needs to make ATP. The point of food, whether we make it or we eat it, is to convert it into usable energy, which is ATP. So even though a plant made glucose doing photosynthesis, it still didn't convert it into ATP. It's still got to take that glucose and convert it into ATP. Just like we eat food, and then we have to take that food and turn it into ATP. So every eukaryotic cell is going to have a mitochondria. So let's look at a chloroplast. Chloroplasts are in plant cells only because their job is to do photosynthesis, which is essentially photosynthesis is converting light energy into chemical energy or food. And again, we'll have its own separate video on photosynthesis. It has a very similar structure to a mitochondria. It has that double membrane structure because again, we're using those membranes to create, to uh, form these electron transport chains to help um, make the chemical reactions happen. Um, these, the structure of chloroplasts and the structure of mitochondria, they're uh, very important to a theory that we'll again talk about more when we do um, evolution, but they're very important to a theory called endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis, uh, the endosymbiotic theory is that the mitochondria and the chloroplast were once free living bacteria, which means they were once their own separate prokaryotic cell. So with no membrane bound organelles. And the theory is that there were larger prokaryotes. So here's a large prokaryote. And essentially that large prokaryote engulfed the smaller mitochondria and these smaller chloroplasts so that eventually we ended up with cells where the two they were working together. So I had this larger prokaryote that now has engulfed the mitochondria, the smaller mitochondrial cell, the smaller chloroplast cell, and now they live together in this endosymbiotic relationship. So we can see it drawn out a little bit better here, right? So we have these original prokaryotes 
a these original prokaryotes the larger prokaryotes here they engulfed these smaller prokaryotes so that we end up with this ancestral eukaryotic, these ancestral eukaryotic cells that have given rise to our current eukaryotic cells. So that is the endosymbiotic theory. Like I said, we'll talk about this more when we talk about evolution. A number one takeaways from today are going to be uh, the different levels of organization, prokaryote versus eukaryote, um, things that all cells have, things that only eukaryotic cells have, and then the various organelles, their functions. Um, can you pick them out from a picture? So like always, make, you know, stars, question marks, write your questions off to the side so we can clarify if there was anything about organization, prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, or the specific organelles that you were struggling with so we can get clarified in preparation for labs and activities.